Hello, and welcome to this lecture, A Practical Guide to Evaluating Secondary Sources. In an ideal world, you would use secondary sources only for their interpretations so you can understand the so-called academic conversation about your topic, and you would use primary sources as the evidence to support your own interpretation. But in the real world, you will mine secondary sources not only for other sources, but also for evidence that you use in your own work. Therefore, you must evaluate all of your sources for accuracy, validity, and reliability. If their research, argument, or interpretation are substandard, their data are likely to be substandard as well. Well, why evaluate? Aren't all published sources truthful and accurate? And quite frankly, no. As Jenny Presnell wrote in the Information Literate Historian, you evaluate sources to, quote, distinguish quality research from substandard research, unquote. But evaluation is not binary. Sources that have problems are not automatically useless. Imagine secondary sources falling on a continuum, a spectrum, if you will, from completely usable at one end through useful to highly usable at the other end. Where secondary sources fall on this continuum depends on how well or poorly they conform to a number of characteristics. Remember that we seek to find sources that are accurate, valid, and reliable, as well as relevant to your research. Let's look at these characteristics. Less usable sources, remember we use unusable for extreme examples, often show these things. The author might be poorly trained, very new to the field, or even come from outside the field. In some cases, authors overstate their credentials, and in others, they are outright frauds. The publications themselves are not vetted or edited particularly well. We usually speak of vetting and editing together. There are the formal processes by which experienced editors and experts decide if new work is acceptably researched and written. You might have heard of the idea of peer review for articles and books. The editor sends manuscripts to readers, peer experts, who evaluate the work's substance and make what's called inquiries that the author must address for the work to be published. Later, a work might undergo a second round of peer review and at least one round of copy editing to make it as clear as possible. Some authors refuse to submit their work for peer review because they don't like the idea or because they have failed to pass through peer review elsewhere. They often pay predatory journals or vanity presses to publish whatever they produce. The low barrier to entry provided by the internet also encourages some authors to bypass vetting and editing. This is not to say that vetting and editing are perfect, but overall, they help ensure that faulty research does not receive the imprimeur of respected scholars and presses. Bias or advocacy might be present in unusable works. Point of view is one thing, but some authors hide an agenda under their credentials. The point of view is so one-sided that they might skew their evidence, they might not make arguments in good faith, they might ignore contrary evidence or interpretations, or they might use propaganda techniques to convince readers to adopt a way of thinking or to adopt an action agenda. Bias and advocacy are the antithesis of sc sound scholarship. They taint everything they touch. Less useful sources might be outdated or rely on refuted data or interpretations. Now, age alone is not a reliable indicator as some exemplary sources may have nailed it years ago. But publication date can be a red flag. The source might have faulty evidence, often the result of an author's agenda or having been replaced by new discoveries or newly opened archives, which render some secondary sources unusable or at least less usable. This is similar to being outdated. Finally, Less useful sources often lack documentation, like source citations. Some publishers demand that researchers tone it down with documentation for fear that the public audience will not buy an academic, quote-unquote, 
book. But for our purposes, those kinds of undocumented sources are problematic. Beware of them and their information. On the other hand, sources that are at the highly useful end of the spectrum share almost opposite qualities. Use these as earmarks, not absolute endorsements. Sources that have these qualities still require you to view their evidence and interpretations with a healthy skepticism. Even the best intentioned writer must leave things out and they might make mistakes. But you should have more rather than less confidence when sources are produced by well-respected authors, come from publishers or journals with reputations for serious vetting and editing, expose authors' points of view, but those authors present them honestly and in good faith, and you don't find obvious bias or advocacy. Authors base their work on recent scholarship and high-quality evidence. They show well-made documentation. Not only is the presence of documentation like citations and bibliographies important, remember there are no bibliographies in journal articles though, but their level of conformity to accepted professional style sheets like Turabian indicates the seriousness of the author's adherence to high standards. So, how do we test for source usability? Examine these criteria drawn from Galgano, Arndt, and Heiser, Doing History, 2008, pages 36 to 38, and repeat, and, and these are repeated in other sources as well. Ask, who is the author? I'll have a suggestion in a minute for other places to look, but start with the book jacket or journal article. Some journals don't publish an author bio with the article, but do so in a separate section of the issue. If you get an article from a database and it does not have the author's bio, browse that issue of the journal too. You can do this online. Ask yourself, who is the intended audience? Is it scholarly or popular? Scholarly audiences demand high levels of rigor and close explanations. Popular audiences, less so. Ask what is the publication date? Some older works are seminal, thus they are important regardless of their date. But this is uncommon. Often older articles and books are simply outdated. New methods, new sources, new styles, new influences, and new interpretations have supplanted them. Stay with the current literature, not with the stuff that's merely easy to find. Ask who published the work. Is the work edited and vetted or peer-reviewed? What is the reputation of the publisher or the journal? To test a source's validity, see if it stands up to internal criticism. That is, is it internally consistent or does information in one place seem to contradict information in another place? Even if inconsistency comes from simple error, solid authors don't make such mistakes. That's part of what the editing process covers. Ask if a source is reliable. It is if it is consistent with other sources. Now, don't carry this too far. I'm not telling you that new interpretations are invalid, but does your source seem to fit with others or does it transparently tell you that it is being inconsistent, that is, arguing with other interpretations? The more you know your topic's historical literature, the easier it is to understand and assess this component. Finally, ask about the source's body of documentation. Does it have citations and or a bibliography? Do those conform to appropriate style sheets? Check a few citations, access them, and see if the author of your source uses them correctly. I'm quite frankly sad to tell you that more than once I've checked well-known author citations and found them to be um, inaccurate. Let's look at the ways to parse the sources that you've already located. That is, to find the best stuff in short order. First, test for the author. Again, look for a biography on the publication or near it. Then do a Google search for the author, even if that person is dead, and check the database Contemporary Authors Online, available through the Troy Library Database website. For books, look for reviews. 
I usually use JSTOR and its advanced search function that allows me to limit my search to book reviews easily. But there are other databases to check. Project Muse is not as intuitive, but just type review into the search bar when you're there. Other databases provided by the Troy Library include Book Review Digest, Book Review Index, and Books in Print. Articles are trickier, as no one reviews them, really. So we use a less robust me metric, the numbers of times an article has been cited, to provide some evidence of its value. For this technique, use Google Scholar. Once your browser is at Google Scholar, type in the article title or the author's name. If you get a correct hit, look in the lower left corner for the cited by label and the number that follows it. This is the number of other sources that Google Scholar knows has cited this article. While numbers alone are no indicator of an article's value, even a high number might exist because other authors are calling it out for being substandard. Those numbers can give you an indication of an article's impact on the topical literature. Let's look now at something else. All researchers must be aware of a peculiar problem with historical sources that goes beyond the academic standards we've discussed so far. Although it's a bigger problem in researching local history, the appearance of heritage-based sources occurs throughout the historical record. Let's look now at the differences between heritage as an enterprise and the discipline of history. Now, they appear to be the same thing. Both deal with and interpret the past, but they are vastly different ways of looking at the world. In this, I followed David Lowenthal, whose 1996 book, Possessed by the Past, tells us that heritage is not really bad history, it's not history at all. Now why is that? Lowenthal writes that the basic function of history is to critically examine the past through its records. History as a discipline aspires to be objective and transparent. Research resu results should be testable. That is, you should be able to follow the sources and at least understand how they support a researcher's interpretation. Historical research methods are rigorous. They follow established rules and their interpretations exist in the realm of plausibility, not only possibility. Finally, historical interpretations are subject to change with new evidence. On the other hand, Heritage does not critically examine the past, but constructs a version of the past to establish or bolster a current identity. Heritage is not an intellectual endeavor, but it is an article of faith. Its method is not rigorous, and its results are neither testable nor limited to the plausible. Possibility is sufficient for heritage practitioners. Heritage argumentation deliberately appeals to emotions, and its interpretations reject new evidence. Heritage builds myths from past events to support a current identity. Don't think that you are not influenced by heritage. You are. But heritage is not history, so beware of sources that appear to be making myths rather than critically examining the evidence of the past. In this video cast, we've examined the continuum of source usability, noting that sources are not merely good or bad, but are more usable and less usable. We looked at characteristics of sources that you can use to begin evaluating these sources' place on that continuum, and thus their value to your research. We then covered practical tests for evaluating sources, followed by methods of finding out about authors and what other scholars think of existing books and articles. Finally, we discuss the problem of heritage and how to avoid those sources that seem to engage in it to the detriment of rigorous historical research. We also noted that heritage is not bad history, for it is not history at all. In closing, I hope you feel more confident in choosing higher quality secondary sources for your work now and in the future.
This ends the lecture, and as always, thanks for your attention.